In mentioning the, the birth of Hazen, I forgot to mention the twin siblings of Hudson and Hadley, and I do that because pray for Corey and Emery with three little ones, like we all need to pray for the little ones in our families, correct? Today, we have chosen two hymns, the one you just sang and the one we will sing at the conclusion of the service, because both of them depict the ongoing life of Jesus Christ while he was on earth. And that's what I want to talk to you about today after we read the scripture, is the life of Jesus Christ. So first, let's look at Luke chapter 6, uh, verses 12 through 19. If you would follow with me, please hear the word of the Lord. In these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom he named apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all over Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him, and he healed all of them. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. Break us, melt us, mold us, and use us. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In dealing with people about their relationship to Jesus Christ, I often hear things of people saying, well, you know, uh, I just can't be as perfect as Jesus. Really? Uh, I hope that sits in really good with you because we can't. We struggle with that of living up to a Savior who is perfect, a Savior who set an example, and He was totally human and totally divine, and just want you to know we're totally human. And it's difficult for us to live up to that. And I don't think we can, but I think we can take a look at his life and we can learn from his life how he obtained what he did in walking with his father. Because he was human. Because he dealt with the same things that we deal with. So I want us to look, and I'm going to quiz you on this, so pay attention. I want us to look at three parts of the life of Jesus that I think are critical for us to have a close relationship with God and be able to walk the earthly life that Jesus Christ has called us to walk. And they are these three things. It's important for us to have communion with the Father. It's important for us to have a community of faith that we're a part of. And it's important for us to learn to grow and have compassion for others who are in need. Those are three very critical pieces of following Christ and being able to walk in relationship with God and helping us to be, I don't like the word successful, but help us to be significant in our walk with God. So let's take a look at them. Out of this passage, we find these three things. First, there's a communion with the Father. If you look at the passage we just read, verse 12 says that he went out on a mountain to pray all night. He had communion with the Father. Communion means to have union with. The first step in having communion with the Father is to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. We call that a relationship because we become a child of God. The second part of that relationship of that is fellowship. Now, I hate to use my grandkids as an example that they're here today, but I'll use my children instead. My daughters have always been my daughters since the day where they were born, and they will be until, well, forever. But there are times when the fellowship is not always the best. Do you all know what I'm talking about as parents and children? Maybe they do some things, and you think, oh, where'd that come from? Why'd they do that? And we have this broken fellowship. 
But when we have communion with God, we need both. We need to have a relationship with God that we're his child, but we also need to have a fellowship where we spend time with him. Is that correct? If you want to get to know somebody, what do you do? You spend time with them. Let's go back to dating relationships. Remember that time? That's not too far back for some of you. Okay, be careful here, all right? But you go back to that time, there was a time when you just could, you couldn't stand not being with that person, not talking to that person, not calling that person, because you wanted to get to know them. And that's what God says to us. I want you to be my child, but I also want you to know who I am. And a vital link of this is understanding that when we have communion with the Father, it's not just praying to Him, but it's learning to listen to His voice. Because he does speak through the scriptures, but in the life of Jesus Christ himself, he spoke to his son Jesus while he was on earth at baptism. And when Jesus came up out of the water, the voice of God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And what we need to learn to do is listen to the voice of the one who calls us beloved. Because he loves us. Now, this communion with Jesus was seen by the disciples because Jesus prayed in the morning, as uh, Ray read in that first passage from Mark. Jesus prayed at night. Two times he prayed all night. In this passage, in the Garden of Gethsemane, both times. He prayed as he ministered with others. He prayed before miracles. He prayed with his disciples. And if you go to John chapter 17, he prayed for you and for me. And then comes a time when the disciples who were noticing this, more is caught than taught, the disciples went to Jesus and said, teach us to pray. And part of that we quote almost every Sunday, the Lord's Prayer. The greatest indication of his communion with the Father was seen in his disciples. Dr. Luke gives us an interesting insight here. He says that Jesus prayed all night and he chose 12 apostles. Let me separate this for you. He probably, this is probably a year and a half into his ministry, he probably had around 150 disciples that were following him. <clears throat> so he goes to the mountainside, and he prays to choose 12 of them to become apostles. The word disciple means learner. The word apostle means sent one. And so he chose these 12 not only to be learners of what he was teaching, but he called them to go to the ends of the earth to be the sent ones. And as believers today, we're both of those. We are called to come and to learn about him, and then we are also called to do what? To go and to be sent into the world. So here we have these 12. But all the time they noticed that when Jesus had struggles, he always went back to the Father. Do you see that in his teaching? So I'm going to illustrate this for you just a moment out of a playground that I grew up on in our neighborhood. We actually had a house, but I went to the playground a lot. But um, in that, don't try this at home, children. Okay, let me put the disclaimer out there. I don't know if you've looked at our beautiful playground, but it's a lot better than it was when I came here. Remember the old wood splinter-filled boards? No padding underneath. Now we have this wonderful, you know, creative safety playground with padding underneath a lot of it. We didn't have that in our playground, okay? We, we were lucky we had a playground. It had a swing, a slide, a seesaw, and a merry-go-round. And let me tell you, it was so bad, you probably need a tetanus shot just to get on the thing. Remember those, all that rust on them? Well, we had two games we played on the merry-go-round. <clears throat> Excuse me. One game was, don't do this at home or at the playground, okay? One was, we, we tried to see how many people we could get on the merry-go-round at one time and still make it move. That was a lot of fun because you could hear that thing just groaning and grinding as we moved around. The second one was a lot more fun. We would put one person at a time on the merry-go-round, and they would start in the center, and we would spin that thing as fast as we could. And as it got going faster, the person would move to the edge, and if you were really brave, you would hang on with one hand and lean out as far as you could. But you know what happened? When you got dizzy, where did you want to go? Back to the center, Right? That's the illustration of our relationship with God. When life begins to spin and things begin to get really difficult and you really feel dizzy, you really feel like maybe you're going to lose your food. That's probably the best way I could say it in church. You do what? You go back to the center to where God is. 
That's the communion that we have with the Father. Another illustration of that would be when Jesus was in the storm. Scott was talking about the fishermen, and they weren't very good fishermen. And, and there's the illustration of the big storm that came up because they came up very quickly like they do here in Florida. And, and there were four professional fishermen in the boat. The storm came up. They were bailing water. Jesus is asleep in the stern of the boat, and they're in a panic. And finally they wake him up, and he says what? Peace be still. It's the same deal. When they felt the struggle and the press of life, they went to where? They went to Christ. They went to their Lord to find strength, to have communion. I've used this illustration before, and most of you remember the illustrations, but you don't remember the sermon, so maybe you'll remember part of the illustration. Richard Foster, the great Quaker writer about this uh, spiritual disciplines, in his book on prayer has an illustration of a dad who took the two-year-old to the mall. That could have been the first mistake right there, okay, taking a two-year-old to the mall. And, and the little boy just didn't want to behave. He didn't want to do anything the dad asked him to do. So finally, the dad picked the boy up in his arms. He began to sing a song to him that did not rhyme. It was off key. And he kept saying, little boy, I love you. I'm so glad you're my boy. You make me happy. I love the way you laugh. And they went on and on from store to store. The father kept just saying this over and over. And when they got to the car, the dad reached over to put the little boy in the car seat. And the little boy looked at him and said, sing it again, daddy. Sing it again. See, that's listening to the Father, the Beloved, to understand where our strength comes from and to have communion, <clears throat> to have communion with Him. So what's the first thing we do in our relationship with Jesus Christ and our walk here on earth? Okay, good. About a third of you got it, and I think that's a pretty good number for a Sunday morning. Excuse me, I'm going to try to get this out of my throat. The second one is, is that we want to have a, a spiritual relationship with a community of faith. So the first part of the church is technically the 12 disciples. Jesus chooses them, these 12 apostles, and said, you're going to help me take the, the message of faith to the ends of the earth. But the community of faith isn't always easy, is it? Church brings some difficult things sometimes, doesn't it? Some of you, like me, may have had scars from your relationship with the church, and you, you have to grow through that. You have to learn to deal with that. So I want to help you to illustrate that today. The communion of these 12 men became his family, his central of focus, so he could pour another year and a half into their lives so that they could take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. It probably wasn't a group that we would vote for on Sunday morning for elders of our congregation. They were a pretty motley crew, pretty, pretty rough around the edges. But what we learned from them is that they learned that Jesus taught them to pray. He taught them to love. He taught them to forgive. He taught them how to serve. And they learned all of this from him, just like Scott said in that book of John MacArthur's. They were ordinary men that God chose to do extraordinary things through, and he will do the same with each of us if we will just be available. But the problem we run into in the church is we get, we get all hung up upon things, and sometimes we forget that the church needs two important ingredients to truly be the community of faith that God's called us to be. They are forgiveness and celebration. Wasn't the two you were expecting, was it? Here it is. Forgiveness in the community is a two-way street that we're willing to forgive each other. And, and some authors have put it this way, that we're willing to forgive each other for not being God in our lives. Or we're willing to forgive each other because we have not been everything we expected someone else to be. I live there often. Because I'm only human. I'm only one person. But in that, we need to learn this. As Nowen says, forgiveness means I'm continually willing to forgive the other person for not being God and for not fulfilling all my needs. 
I had a guy in a Sunday school class of about 40 singles one time came to me after a Bible study and said, well, you didn't find that little gem in the scriptures that just really excited me about my faith today. And I looked him square in the eye and I said, if it is my job to find something to just to bring you closer to Christ with one little gem you hadn't heard before, then I will be very successful in failure. Because it's not about what I bring, it's about what you learn and you grow on your own. And hopefully I can emphasize some things to help that growth. Forgiveness without celebration is a difficult thing. The community is in a way a a mosaic of different individuals and pieces and people that we come together to be in unity. I want to talk about that more about that next week. So the question is, can we forgive our family for not having loved us as well as we wanted to be loved? Can we give the church for not being exactly what we want to be? And so we come to this. The best illustration that I can come up to help us with this is the prodigal son. I think it's probably the best parable in the world. You know the story. The younger brother wanted the money from the family. He got it. He took off. He squandered it because prodigal does not mean someone who ran off and did bad things. Prodigal actually means extravagant. He was extravagant with the family's money. That's why I think it ought to be called prodigal God, not prodigal son, because God is extravagant with what? His love for us. The son returns, and so he sees the son coming. He runs, which would have been uncharacteristic of a father that day and time, very uncharacteristic. He grabs the son. The son has his speech all memorized. The father doesn't want to hear the speech. The father wants to give him a robe and some sandals and a ring and kill the fatted calf. receives this wonderful gift from the father that he's come home and he gets the fatted calf, he gets the party, he gets the ring, he gets the robe, he gets the shoes and over in the corner of the picture that Rembrandt paints is this picture of the older brother and he is not a happy camper. Because the older brother sometimes is recognized as the church and you probably haven't heard many sermons on the older brother. Because the older brother says to the father, I have been here all this time, I have done everything you've asked me to do and you haven't given me one party. But you let that son of yours take all of our money and go out there and spend it. That's the teaching. In the church of Jesus Christ, you cannot go to the party of celebration if you're not willing to bring forgiveness first. That's the community of faith that the church of Jesus Christ is to be. What was the first one? Second one? Okay, you're getting a little better, but you're all kind of shy about it, okay? And the third one is what? Compassion. Jesus came down from the mountain. He chose the 12. They went to a level place. Don't miss that teaching. When you come to the foot of the cross, it doesn't matter what degree you have. It doesn't matter how many athletic scholarships you have. It doesn't matter how many millions you've made. When you come to the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ, the ground is level because we all come by sinners seeking grace. And he began to heal the people. He began to touch them, and they began to touch him because power was coming out. There is a phrase there I struggle with when it says, and, all, and healed all of them. I struggle with that because I don't see that today, and I didn't see that in other areas of his ministry. Jesus didn't heal every sick person on the earth at that time. But what we find here is we find this thing of compassion. And the word compassion means to be with those who suffer, to bend down, and to come to those who are in pain. And Jesus did that when he became the Emmanuel, God with us, who came from heaven down to earth and pitched his tent with us, as John says in John 1, because he had compassion for us. That's sometimes why I don't like being up here, because I think as a pastor you should be down the level with the people because we are together seeking compassion from God together. Morrison McNeil and Nowen put it this way, and I quote, It is not a bending down towards the unprivileged from a privileged position, that is compassion. It is not a reaching out from an on high to those who are less fortunate below, it is not a gesture of sympathy or pity for those who fail to make it to the upward pull. On the contrary, compassion means going directly to those people in places where suffering is most acute and building a home there. 
That is what compassion is. And Jesus came down, and he touched these people, and he healed them, and he blessed them, and they saw such power they wanted to touch him. So I'm going to close with one little illustration to help you to understand that. And it comes from a college town in a college setting where there was a church across the street from a university. And in that, the church was a uh, conservative, uh, beautiful church. And they had a house full of people that Sunday. And Bill was a college student. And Bill had a T-shirt. He had long hair. And he had jeans that had holes in them. Long before you paid to have the holes in the jeans. And then he had a baseball cap on and no shoes. And as he came into the sanctuary, he couldn't find a place to sit. If you can visualize it, if this place was full, he came all the way down the aisle and couldn't find a place to sit, so he placed himself right here in front of the chancel on the floor. And, of course, you know what it was like. All the air came out of the room. Two or three people were on life support because of what was happening. And then out of nowhere, the pastor's waiting because Bill was late and it's time for the sermon. And so the pastor is sitting on the chancel and he sees one of the deacons get up from the back. Lesson for the deacons here. And the deacon began to make his way down the aisle. And the deacon, probably 80 years old in his three-piece suit and his cane. I'm not sure he was holding his top hat at that time maybe doing the Tim Conway shuffle coming down the aisle trying to make it. And everybody in the room was wondering what in the world is going to happen. And so the pastor decided to let the whole thing play out. But it played out differently than a lot of people thought because the deacon didn't come and chastise the young man. The deacon, in all of his ability at that age, sat next to Bill to listen to the sermon. Compassion means to come down and to be with. The pastor got up and said these words, you will not remember a word I say today, but you will remember the image of compassion that was just played out before you. You see, all three of those are critical for our Christian life. I cannot be the child of God that God wants me to be if I'm not in communion, not only just talking to God, but listening. I've never heard the voice of God audibly, but I have felt the Spirit of God in such a way that I knew that it was Him moving me to do something. And I know there are many scriptures and people who God has spoken through to guide me along my journey as a Christian and as a pastor. And then the community of faith. It's important for us to be open enough, just like we are in our families. There's a lot of families who really need forgiveness so that the family gatherings are a lot more fun. I can say that because I'm a part of a family. And I'm also a part of the family of God. And the third is, is that we need to also look beyond us because if you really want to study the reason the church was birthed, it was not for itself. The church was the instrument, the institution that God designed to take his message to the world. And when we sit around and complain about my needs aren't being met in worship or in ministry, we have the wrong focus. And by the way, worship should not be about you. It should be about God. And ministry should not be about us within the church. It should be preparing us in edification and learning to go engage the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to have all three of these folks to become the spiritual leaders that God has designed us and called us to be because all of us are leaders, because all of us have an influence somewhere in our world that nobody else has that influence. And he has called us to take us to the ends of the earth so that we can be in communion with him have a group of believers that prays for us and encourages us and forgives us so that we can have the compassion to go to the world and take the gospel for his glory. To God alone be the glory. Amen.
Again, let me thank you for joining us in our worship today at First Presbyterian Church of Gainesville. I invite you to come on Sunday and join us personally at 1055 in our sanctuary at 106 Southwest 3rd Street in downtown Gainesville. We have other ways to be involved in the ministry offerings of First Presbyterian Church, children's ministry, music ministry, a ministry with college students. You can reach us at 352-378-1527 or on the web at 1stpc.org.